All right, thanks. So this is an overview of a hike to Leisure City Natural Area from July 16th this year. And the intention of this is to give the viewer an idea about the plants and some of the interesting geology found at Leisure City. Also help you plan your trip in the future. So Leisure City is uh, just north of Golconda in Pope County off of Route 146 on, uh, you can take Lusk Creek Road. So this is a uh, circled right here in red and then the natural area is in, highlighted in blue. And uh, let me zoom in here. So getting to Leader City, what you do is you take Route 146 where my cursor is up to Lusk Creek Road and it'll go up north for a bit, west, then north, and you'll hit Dutton Chapel Road. Uh, I put a little star next to the parking lot. This is like an old uh, parking lot, old church uh, parking lot. And uh, what you'll do is walk this road here up to the natural area, but that's where you'll want to park. And I've been talking about, I've been using the word natural area a lot. So what is a natural area? This is uh, sites that are referred to uh, Illinois Natural Areas Inventory Sites. And these are places that have been identified because of their interesting natural communities uh, that are found in Illinois, representative of Illinois. And first inventories were from 1975 to 1978 and updated most recently in 2007 and 2010. This is really cool, but in Illinois was the first state to have a comprehensive natural areas inventory. Last time we had gone to the greater Shawnee Hills, and now this time we're in the lesser Shawnee Hills natural division. These are um, characterized by their um, really interesting feature of limestone glades. And so uh, these are glades, open areas with prairie species growing in them. So this is like remnant prairie species that are growing in these open areas and these uh, with limestone, limestone substrate. You can see right here, this is from the Leisure City Glade, um, just a big open area with open grown trees too and um, big chunks of limestone rock all right at the surface. A couple more photos here that you can see these big open grown trees here and a lot of times these are maintained with uh, prescribed fire to keep these areas open. For a trails overview this was about a mile and a quarter hike overall and then um, with additional um, plant identification and wandering was about a mile and a half. Although it took four hours because um, along the way, um, you know, taking track of uh, plants and, um, you know, just kind of taking your time and taking the whole area in. And difficulty, moderate there uh, at the uh, beginning um, of it, there is some elevation um, changes. So it goes down and then back up again. And this is a there and back trail. Uh, so you'll, uh, it's not a loop. For the trails overview. So these are my tracks from the day out. And so you walk off on this road here off of Dutton Chapel where the parking lot was. So you would have been parked right here. You're walking north. And right here there's a culvert um, and you can jut off to the east and the trail uh, takes you down through the woods here. And so this is what it looks like in the photo here what the trail looked like and it'll take you down up to the glade and there's the you know, the top of the glade right there so you can see there's an elevation change as you go down um, off this road bed right here it'll go down first then back up to the glade and this has been divided into two parts of a hike so the first part is a hike through the woods to the glade and there's this road bed i've been talking about that you can hike um, up to the limestone, 
to the limestone glade here. And then the sec part two is turn around and come back since it's a there and back. It's a, a pretty straightforward um, hike. Plant stats from the day out. Overall, there was 137 species identified and 59 families. And the most represented ones were the aster, uh, Fabaceae or bean, and Poaceae or grass family. Sporophyte uh, diversity was a little lower, um, uh, quite a bit lower actually from uh, our time out at Panther Den last time. Uh, so we had one species represented in uh, spleenworts, shield ferns, and adder's tongues families. And then notable mentions were carrots represented by five. And then we already mentioned that these other three, uh, the roses and the mints with nine and six. So a pretty good uh, slew of species out there to identify. And they're, um, the, you know, the fun thing about going out to glades and um, open areas like this is that it's a different suite of species too. So we have eight activities to do along the way uh, on your hike from here to there and back again. So you can kind of have a scavenger hunt along the way. Uh, so you have part one is find two grasses and a carex. Uh, find three species in the bean family. Capture a stunning photo of a pollinator. Observe the tendrils of passion flower. Locate and identify uh, these three species here, agave, cliff break fern, and the late horse gentian. Now identify five species in the aster family. Locate and identify Batelia obliqua. And then finally, when you're all done with everything, bring a chair and relax on top of the glade with a friend and uh, just admire the beauty of this wonderful place. Think about glades. Think about the management that goes into keeping glades. Uh, the way they are. Here's some landscape shots. This is from the visit out there. The trail going in. Right at the base of the glade. So this would have been actually after going through down that valley and back. And um, so now you're at the base of it. And then uh, now actually on top of the glade here in both of these photos. It's pretty uh, abrupt changes too uh, in the landscape. It just kind of juts right up into this glade community. Another picture. And then going into signage, all these natural areas, um, and same goes for all those other ones that were on the um, map I showed a few slides ago where all the yellow um, borders were um, outlined. They're all uh, delineated by these uh, yellow signs. So you'll know when you're in the natural area um, if uh, you find these signs here. And so that was basically all the signage that there was. There's not. Um, really anything off the side of the road or anything like that that would let you know other than um, just knowing the direction you're going. So going on with activity one, um, find two grasses and a carex. We got um, Elemis hysterix here, bottle brush grass. This is a good one to identify and good one to uh, be able to spot because it's uh, it persists for a long time and it's out right now uh, looks just like this um, but it looks like a bottle rush. Danthonia spicata is the uh, second one. Poverty oats grass. Um, another good one to be able to identify. Uh, this has all these curly little hairs down at the base of the leaves um, and so this is another one that you can um, identify outside of this season too. Um, and then a Carex. Uh, this one, this Carex swanii that um, was chosen this time around, uh, this has got pubescent perigenia and leaves. 
So that's hairs present on the leaves and perigenia arpubescent. So that's checking a few boxes um, of, uh, in the CAREX key that make this one an um, easier identifiable one than, um, than some of the others. So um, what with CAREX swanii, the uh, whole entire species list can be uh, shared. We also um, had found um, CAREX muhlenbergia, or CAREX muhlenbergii as well. And uh, all right, so moving on, find three beans. Went with this one here, Desmodium possiflora. I don't usually, I don't see this one all the time, uh, the white flowered tick tree foil. So I went along with this one as a, as a cool one to, to try to get on the list. Um, Desmodium rotundifolium, uh, the round tick tree foil. So this is, uh, yeah, very, very round leaves. It's usually kind of uh, spread out along the ground here on these drier open woods. And uh, I always like seeing this one. So uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's like little money coins. It looks like it's always a fun one to see. Uh, then Tephrosia virginiana. Uh, it's not in bloom anymore, but this has a really pretty pink flower. Pink, it's two colors, pink and white flower. Um, it's called goat's rue. That's another one in the bean family. And so it'll have, see, it's got these uh, really kind of uh, interesting looking um, leaves. It kind of looks like a, like a honey locust leaf. It's very hairy too. And uh, yeah, when it's in flower, it's really pretty. Uh, some backup species here, just in case uh, you don't end up finding um, a Desmodium possiflora. Um, there is a Desmodium lavigatum and glutinosum uh, that they both have pink flowers and are also in the uh, bean family. So they were found along the way as well. There was a lot of beans that were found. Um, some Lespedezas were also found. So uh, that was a, that's a good one. And then um, also, you know, some bean trees that uh, red buds were found too. Activity number three, so this is capture a stunning photo of a pollinator. So while I was sitting there um, at the end, I had started wanting to um, capture some photos here. Um, you know, this would, that one's not so great. Uh, it's kind of blurry, <laughs> but it, these are in progressing order from um, my worst shot to my best shot. And so not so great, getting better. Oh, I could start winning awards with this one here. That is fantastic. <laughs> but there's so many opportunities to uh, to capture some really good shots uh, out there. And uh, there's lots of butterflies and milkweeds out there uh, and uh, also asters that uh, were all over the place and pollinators on them. So activity number four, this is uh, observe the tendrils of passion flower. So there's passion flower that you was know, scattered throughout and they have these really, really interesting tendrils. Um, they look like little phone cords. And just like phone cords, they do this part right here where they kind of autocorrect. And so uh, this is a, called the helical perversion. And uh, there's a paper I found while I was looking into this that Darwin had uh, brought this, uh, this idea in uh, the helical perversion where it does this autocorrect basically and it helps to distribute weight. Um, I found another video about talking about um, the structure of this and how it helps to support the, uh, the plants. And uh, so it's a pretty interesting structure here or twists right there. And, uh, and so it's in flower right now too. Uh, they have really interesting flowers too. Uh, Passiflora lutea. And the leaves, kind of indistinguishable here. And another close up right here of the helical perversion. And a close up of the flower. 
that uh, this, oops, sorry. This link here is uh, um, it was from back in 2012, but uh, it has a, it's a video, a link to a video of uh, the passion flower talking about the tendril movements and all of that. So um, we can share that too. So activity five, we have agave. Uh, I find and identify agave, cliff break fern, and the late horse gentian. So we'll start with the agave. This is Manfreda virginica. And it's in flower right now. So it's got these long flower spikes coming up and um, very interesting looking flowers. And then I have another photo um, in the next slide here of uh, the succulent um, basil leaves. So it's um, between those two, those two features going on right now. Um, you, sh you should be able to find that one pretty easily. This cliff break fern, Palea atra purpurea. Now this is one of my favorite ferns to see. I don't see it too often, but it's very narrow leaved um, right here. And all of the sori are on the leaf margins. So uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, um, placement for them. And um, the petiole and rachis, so if you were to key this out from the other um, um, Pelia that we have here, uh, the uh, petiole and rachis are pubescent um, nearly throughout is what um, was said in the Molenbrock and then uh, as opposed to uh, glabrous. So that is the cliff break fern and I have a close up of the photos in a few slides. And then this was a fun one to see. All these little tomato looking things. It's uh, the late horse gentian. Triosteum perfoliatum. And it's perfoliatum because it's got this perfoliate leaf right here. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, it's just an interesting one. You don't see it too often. It's in open, dry areas. Its distribution is kind of scattered according to the uh, Molenbrock book, too, um, and is uh, less common down here. This is a shot of the agave here, the Manfreda virginica. And succulent leaf right here you can see. And um, with the other uh, photo that I had put up with the uh, flowers that are up right now, um, this should be a pretty indistinguishable plant to see. And then another close up here of the marginal sori here, and then the really narrow leaves, you can see, of the Pelea atropurpurea, the cliff break fern. So one of the, this, this was the, the most uh, present family out, out throughout the entire glade. Um, and I chose five species in the aster family, but there was, uh, you know, there's 18 that were identified and there may be more too, you know, it's not, uh, like I said, uh, we might not have identified all of them, but uh, Rativita bipinnata is one of the, the first one that we chose here. It's got very dissected leaves too. And with these uh, flower heads right now, um, it's really good one to get um, identified. The Sylphium integrifolium, rosin weed, Solidago um, ulmifolia. So ulmifolia, um, so it has leaves like an elm. And so there's some um, elm looking leaves there on the Solidago. The Helianthus divericatus. So it's very scabrous leaves, and uh, the leaves are pointing almost directly across from each other, very perpendicular to the uh, leaf stem. And then Nebulus altissimus. Uh, this is the uh, lettuce, and uh, it's got very noticeable leaves, too. I chose all the asters um, that had kind of different leaf uh, 
arrangements so it would be kind of a, a little bit easier to find them all. Okay, so next one here, locate and identify Matilia obliqua. This is the vining milkweed. Um, so first you would find, it, this is, and this is found, this was found all over the glade. Um, and so you'll find a vine here and it'll have this chordate leaf base like that. Um, and it's kind of out of bloom right now. It, it, you might find some in bloom still, but uh, mostly look for this vining, um, Vine plant with chordate leaf base. This actually used to be a, a listed species, was delisted, um, and really likes these open uh, glade areas, these open glade settings. And you can see some of the leaves of uh, Rattibida right here, also. And then there's some leaves of the Helianthus uh, divaricatus right there, too, that we were just talking about. Oh, and um, actually, uh, here's a, uh, some obedient plant right there, too, in this photo. That's a fun photo. Okay, so then getting through the whole hike and um, you're tired, just bring a chair, um, bring a friend. So I was fortunate enough to have come out there with Chris Benda and uh, we got to just hang out on top and um, admire the beauty of the entire glade. Um, these are kind of really interesting plant communities and so we, um, we're happy, both pretty excited to get to come here and identify all the plants there. And here's a couple more shots of the day there. This is you know, the view from sitting here. It was a pretty hot day out there too. It was uh, uh, definitely a uh, high summer right now. So with that, uh, that's all. That's what we got right here. Um, enjoy the hike when you come out there. Um, if you got any uh, questions or anything about uh, directions or anything like that, um, I'll let you know. Alrighty. Thanks a bunch, Nick. That was great. Absolutely. So if anybody has any questions for Nick or any comments on that, feel free to um, put them in the chat box and then we'll ask you at the end, uh, Nick. So what, okay. what we're going to do now uh, is turn it over to Brianna for our second presentation of the night. So I will just go ahead and let you introduce yourself, um, Brianna, and take it from here. All right, cool. Thank you so much. I'll share my screen and then we'll get started. Okay. All right, so my name is Brianna Whitley and I am at, currently a master's student at SIU. Um, and what was once the plant biology department. And I'm excited to be here today. There's a lot of people in the audience that I admire. So this is kind of crazy. Um, and I'm not an expert on plant insect interactions, although I do find them very interesting. And my lights also keep flickering on and off, so I'm sorry. Uh, but hopefully today we can shed some light on what happens in the dark by discussing plant moth interactions. So I was inspired to discuss this topic because um, we are just finishing National Moth Week. So what is now a global citizen science project began as a local education and outreach program. So this is something to put on your calendars for next year and it might inspire you to learn a little bit more about moths like it did me. So moths are in the order Lepidoptera and this includes their close relatives, butterflies, and Lepidoptera literally means scaled wings. So these are scaled winged insects. And there's a lot of rules that people try to use to differentiate butterflies and moths. But if you were to ask a Lepidopterist, what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? They would likely say that butterflies are simply diurnal or day active moths. And when you ask someone, imagine a Lepidoptera, the first thing that likely comes to mind are these bright charismatic butterflies. 
when in fact, our butterflies are just a fraction of the diversity within the order Lepidoptera. So if we look at this figure here on the left of my screen, we can see that the orange lines represent butterfly families and these purple lines represent lepidopt uh, moth families. So we have about 160,000 species of moths and only 17,500 known species of butterflies. So when we think Lepidoptera, we should definitely consider our moth friends. And in North America, moths outnumber butterflies 10 to 1. So with this huge species richness and all these different morphologies and adaptations, there's going to be a lot of different interactions that may come into play. And especially since moths and butterflies have the um, unique life cycle of complete metamorphosis, we have the larval interactions as well as the adult moth interactions. So for example, um, here we have the goldenrod gall moth. And this is an example of internal feeding where the larvae will feed on the pith of the goldenrod stem. Then we have the gypsy moth, a well-known um, economic agricultural pest, and it's an external feeder. So it's uh, feeding on leaves and it can actually completely defoliate trees. So not a good thing. And then we have um, our adult interactions with some adults that are are nectivorous, meaning they have this straw-like tongue known as a proboscis and they're visiting flowers and feeding on the nectar. But I'll mention that um, not all adult moths have mouth parts or proboscis. Some completely lack them, but today we're going to focus on these interactions of nectivorous adults and flowering plants. And I wanted to focus on these interactions because when we think about the evolution of flowering plants and the evolution of Lepidoptera, we really have to consider both of them because in order for plants to be to have reproductive success, they had to adapt these reward and attraction systems to attract their pollinators. So as we can see, um, we had the appearance of moths long before we had the appearance of angiosperms, but then we had this synchronous um, evolution of both these groups. So when we're thinking about plants, we're always thinking about these interactions with their pollinators and other insects. And typically when someone thinks about moth pollination, the first thing that come to mind are our diurnal or day visiting of moths in the sphingidae uh, family. So that's our hawk moths and sphinx moths. But nocturnal moths represent greater than 75% of the Lepidoptera species diversity. So when we're thinking of moth pollination, we really have to think about our night visitors. So who are some of the players in this uh, night pollination game? Uh, some of the representatives include the geometrid moths, the noctuid moths, the arribid moths, known as the tiger moths, and then the sphingid or sphinx and hawk moths. So these are not um, an exhaustive list of all the flower visiting uh, moth species, but these are examples that are commonly encountered visiting flowers at night. So again, when we're thinking about these interactions between flowers and their pollinators, we're thinking about some of the traits that have evolved together um, to form these relationships. This is what's commonly called a pollination syndrome. So when we think about moth pollination, we have flowers that typically have this linalool flower scent, so it's like a spicy floral scent, and uh, we have nocturnal scent and nectar production. So this nectar and scent production actually is gene regulated to have this circadian rhythm um, to be partnered with uh, these night foraging insects. And then of course our moth species have uh, this well-developed olfactory system so that they can sense these floral cues. Additionally, uh, moth pollinated plants usually have a long narrow corolla tube or flower tube and uh, these flower visiting moths typically have a long proboscis. And then we have 
conspicuous contrasting flowers that are typically white or lighter in color. And um, they, then we have the moths that have developed night vision, which is amazing. We don't have night vision. And they have compound eyes that are sensitive to these low light levels so that they can see these flowers. And usually the flowers have a large flower display, making it easier to see them from long distances. So they'll have one large solid, they'll have many large solitary flowers, or they'll have a lot of small flowers. So now that we know a little bit more about uh, moth pollination biology, let's talk about some examples found here in Illinois. So first uh, we have Platanthera leucophaea, and its pollinator, the Tursa sphinx moth. And this relationship was actually just discovered in 2004. So this very uh, recent uh, discovery of this relationship. And when we think about our orchids, we know that these are um, all state listed as endangered or threatened. So when we're thinking about the conservation of some of these really beloved plants, we have to think about the conservation of their pollinator species as well. So this is an example of a specialized relationship because currently this is the only known pollinator um, of this species. And in fact, these are actually um, usually hand pollinated um, in their populations. And these are found in Northern and Central Illinois. Then we have Silene salata and Hadina ectypa, its pollinator. Silene salata is usually found in high quality habitats throughout Illinois. So it's widely distributed, but occurs occasionally. And then we have um, its pollinator here, which is typically rare as well. And this is an example of nursery pollination where uh, the adult moth will visit the flower and drink the nectar and then lay the eggs on the ovary wall. And as those eggs develop and the larvae hatch, the larvae will actually feed on the developing fruits. So then it's a seed predator and a pollinator of this species. So we have this cool example of this antagonistic yet mutualistic relationship between these two organisms. But despite having this very specialized relationship with its pollinator, um, it's also visited by some general nectivores uh, that are visiting other flowers as well, such as the American ear moth, such a cute little guy. And then another example that you might be more familiar with is a common milkweed, Asclepia syrica, and uh, one of its pollinators, the variegated cutworm moth. So this uh, relationship um, was discovered in 17, uh, 1979 and in this study, they looked at the concentration and volume of nectar along with its diurnal pollinators uh, with a number of things. And they actually found that the greatest volume of nectar and the highest sugar content was being produced in Asclepia syrica between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So while this common milkweed is visited by a number of diurnal pollinators, it's also adopted these traits to attract our nocturnal pollinators as well. So again, this is an example of a generalist relationship. Um, common milkweed is not specialized for this pollinator and this pollinator is not specialized for this milkweed. And a common misconception that a lot of people may have is that when it comes to moth pollination, we're always talking about these specialized relationships. So one plant species and one moth species. So a famous example is Dar Darwin's orchid, where Darwin um, received this orchid. He saw the long nectar spur and him and Wallace both predicted, okay, well, this is probably pollinated by a moth species with a huge proboscis. And then hundreds of years later, we found that to be true. But these specialized relationships are more of an exception to the rule. And the rule is that most of our moth pollinators are generalist. So at night, they're visiting many different uh, floral species and providing this redundancy to our diurnal pollinators, acting as maybe a safety net uh, for pollination of many of our plant species. 
And I found this to be very important, especially when we think about the trend of global decline for a lot of our diurnal pollinators. So everyone's probably heard the story of our periled pollinators, but what's also perilous is our lack of information about our nocturnal pollinators. And this is exhibited in the literature when some authors wrote, but given the vast number of moth species, many aspects about their pollination ecology is at best uncertain and at worst left unexplored. So we still have a lot of ground to cover as far as the interactions between plants and moths. And so if there's anyone in the audience that's looking for um, maybe a grad school project or your niche into really getting to understand more about nature and some of these intimate relationships, moth and plant interactions might be a great place for you to start. So hopefully um, through this talk, you've developed a love for moths and hopefully you love moths as much as moths love lamp. And with that, I'll share my references with anyone interested and I'll take any questions.